Welcome again to the ESCP webinar series, Beyond COVID, Inspiration for Change. I'm Sean Bright, the Director of ESCP Executive Education based on our Paris campus. This is the fourth in a series of webinars presented by experts and faculty from our campuses in Paris, Madrid, London, Torino, and Berlin. And, and these webinars are really designed to give you some perspectives, also some practical advice in the context of this COVID situation. Uh, in our past uh, webinars, we've already looked at, uh, at some different areas, such as remote leadership and management, customer buying behavior in a, in a crisis situation, and also the impact of COVID on your digital strategy. So you're very welcome, of course, to access these webinars on our site. Today, we're going to be looking at uh, a very different subject in our webinar, working in an improbable world. What can you learn from artists? We're going to look at creativity today and creative thinking. Now, I think we've all had to be very creative these last few weeks, uh, creative working at home, sometimes with children, running around, shouting during uh, important meetings, uh, creative in responding to our clients' changing needs, and even in adapting our products and services uh, for our clients in this, this new normal. So I'm delighted to have uh, Sylvain Bureau joining us today. We'll be discussing how we can use art uh, as a way to boost our creative spirit and our, our, our creative reflexes, if you like. So, Sylvain Bureau, uh, a PhD from Ecole Polytechnique, is a professor of entrepreneurship in uh, UCPA Business School and the scientific director of the Jean Baptiste Institute, which is the Entrepreneurship Institute at ESCP. Uh, Sylvain's main research topics are creative practices in entrepreneurship, both startup and in, in large corporations. For executive education, Sylvain teaches regularly in our custom programs, as well as on our executive MBA and in our newly launched Global Executive PhD. Uh, Sylvain has developed the art thinking method, uh, which is a way of creating the improbable with, with certainty. And we'll be discovering this today in today's uh, presentation. Sylvan, I know that uh, you and your teams have been developing this method uh, and this project really for the last 10 years. Uh, an art thinking program, several programs actually have been run in ESCP, of course, but also in the Ecole de Guerre and Ecole 42 in France. Sylvan also trains trainers in this method at Stanford. Uh, in HEC Montreal, uh, University of Ulu in Finland, and in Musashino Art University in Japan. I know this training has had a real impact on, on attendees, especially as the sessions often take place in unique locations, which are, are very conducive to creativity, such as the Don Pompidou in Paris, uh, the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, or the Blockhouse in, in Tokyo. So a very exciting and innovative uh, project indeed. We're looking forward to discover this. Just before we, we begin, I'd like to mention our, our, our timing for today. So Sylvan's presentation will last approximately 30 minutes. Okay? We'll then have about 15 minutes for questions uh, at the end. This webinar is interactive and we'll be very happy to have your feedback, your opinions and your input during the presentation. Uh, if you can look at the, the top of the screen, the next slide, uh, you can see, um, uh, if you look at the top of, this, uh, of the screen, you will see uh, a, a caption, uh, www.menti.com, there we go, uh, with a code number. Okay? Uh, and so for those of you who've never used a Menti meter before, I'll explain to you now how it works. It's very simple. So you simply take your phone, uh, you type in www.menti.com, then enter the code which is, which is on the screen, so 429601. This will allow us to have your, your feedback, your opinions throughout the presentation. We'll have some small uh, surveys for you to reply to during, during, during the presentation. Uh, you'll also have the opportunity to submit questions to, to Sylvan today uh, by typing your questions in the questions pane at the, of the control panel. And you can make you can send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the QA session at the end of today's presentation. So without further ado, I will leave the floor to, to Sylvan and I will see you all again at the end of the presentation for your questions. 
All right, so thank you so much, uh, Sean. Uh, welcome, thank you very much for your time. I'm super happy to share with you this, uh, this webinar. Uh, to start, uh, I'd like to share with you this uh, painting from uh, Edouard Manet. Um, and actually, it's a very interesting painting because to some extent, we can say that uh, artists uh, were locked down. To some extent, they were locked down because they used to work in their studio. They were working in their studio and they were not painting outside. And Claude Monet was one of the first painters to decide to change the way um, he was working, to get outside and to capture landscape uh, directly the closest, to the closest uh, uh, parts of the landscape. So here he's on his boat uh, creating a new painting. We used to be, for most of us, locked down. We can go outside now. Uh, and the question that we may want to raise is, are we going to uh, work in the same way? Are we going to change and shift our practices, just like Monet uh, shift his practice and, and create this movement of impressionism? To address this topic, uh, I will present four sections. Uh, one related to what I call the society of certainty, so that's our context, and how this society of certainty is challenged by uh, COVID-19. Then we'll uh, see uh, a practice, the practice of deviation, and how artists are playing with this practice to leverage the improbable. We'll see after that how we can use this practice of deviation outside the art world, and then I will share this art making method that Sean mentioned to you. Okay, so let's start uh, with the context. Maybe you know this piece uh, from uh, Andy Rowell. Uh, who, to me, is really the illustration, perfect illustration of the society of certainty. So basically, everywhere in the world, at any time, you can drink Coca-Cola and you are sure about the exact standard of this Coca-Cola. So you have no surprise, uh, you have a certain quality, uh, you are sure of what you're going to get. And of course, beyond Coca-Cola, many industries offers, offer this kind of uh, certainty uh, with a standards quality which is uh, reassuring for us uh, and that you can get everywhere. This society which uh, is not only in the food business but also in tourism, in culture, in uh, uh, auto industry, uh, even in, in maybe love activities with Tinder of uh, friendship with Facebook is heavily challenged by COVID-19 uh, and we tend to see uh, this kind of situation. So I don't know if you heard about this uh, crazy uh, um, story uh, which happened uh, in a museum in the US in Missouri. Uh, so the museum was obviously closed because of COVID-19. And then they invited uh, some animals, penguins, uh, from the local zoo to uh, discover the painting. So here we, you know, we are in this highly improbable situation. Basically, you cannot really predict such a scene it's highly uh, uh, unlikely that something like that can happen. And of course, it's disturbing about the standards. You know, what, what are the standards of the museum? It's hard to tell anymore. So we are entering a world which is much more uncertain. So you have this painting from René Magritte, The Principle of Uncertainty, where our shadows do not look like our traditional shadows. And uh, the shadows of this woman is, is uh, no longer normal. It's a bird. And a lot of our shadows disappeared and something else uh, you know, emerged. How we can make sense of that? Uh, and what are the implications of these uh, changes? Well, the implications uh, are that many uh, you know, practices that we used to have, many processes, many competencies, many results are no longer working very well. Uh, if you look at restaurants, hotels, uh, air travel, uh, this, is, this is completely upside down and the results are getting worse and worse. Before we continue, I would like to know more about you. You know, what's your own situation? Do you observe this kind of trends where your level of performance are decreasing regarding your competencies, your practices, your, comp your, your processes? So to check that, uh, maybe we can have a little and quick uh, quiz. Uh, so if you want to use uh, this, uh, your cell phone and start to vote uh, to answer uh, this question. So do you, do you believe that the current crisis is challenging your level of performance? Yes, no, not sure. Uh, 
so we have already a lot of answers coming uh, and and basically it's kind of uh, obvious that most of us uh, seems to have some trouble and you know myself included I used to teach very experiential uh, learning teaching workshops and now I have to be behind my laptop at home it's really weird and very hard to some extent so my, my norms are also completely upside down so here a vast majority of you have this experience of this situation challenging the way they were the question is how do we manage that how can we react to that what can we do i don't have the magic recipe uh, but maybe that we can look at what's happening in the art world and that's a practice uh, which is called the deviation that i think could be useful it can be useful to rethink about our norms the way we work and maybe get outside just like claude monet so what does it involve two uh, new pieces one from marcel duchamp and one from pablo picasso at that time when they created these pieces a lot of people were saying this is not art and maybe some of you may think the same uh, but actually these are uh, perfect examples of deviation what does it mean deviations are practices where you will introduce elements which are not supposed to be uh, included in your context to create something new so for instance elements of a bike that you're going to be uh, are going to be introduced in the art scene to create a piece of art this is kind of weird because this is not extremely hard to do uh, it doesn't involve you know hard very advanced skills in terms of sculpture some people may say it's not exactly beautiful compared to greek antique sculpture so this is confusing and deviations to some extent are made to be confusing so at the beginning you don't even know what you're doing but you start playing with that playing with things around yourself and things can happen deviation can be simple like these ones or can be a bit more complex so let's take another example with the famous painting of Les Demoiselles d'Avignon uh, from Pablo Picasso. Here you also have some sense of deviation. So of course Picasso got inspired by many, many artists uh, like Ingres, like um, El Greco, like Cézanne. Uh, but he was also deviating things which were not supposed to be in the Western art world. Two main deviations. So one is the primitive art uh, with these African masks that you can recognize on the picture on the painting on the right side of the painting with these uh, new faces, uh, very unusual faces for women. And uh, he was also using concepts in mathematics because a friend of, of Picasso, Maurice Prince, gave him some tips and information about the new work of Henri Poincaré, French mathematicians, about the fourth dimension. And he gave him this, this book about it and of course using that he was able to rethink about the question of perspectives about composition about colors uh, and all these things create a brand new approach uh, about what a painting is and here to some extent we can say that these painters these artists picasso and duchamp were below the norm when we are at school when we are in our company, we try to be beyond the norm. We try to be good at what we do, respecting you know, some criteria. These artists were below the norm. And to some extent, I think one of the questions we can ask is how to be not close to the existing norm, but how can we be below the norm? So the deviation is doing that. Basically, what we are uh, doing when we work is we assess our results based on, uh, you know, some, some actions. So we, we do something, we have some results, and we try to improve the actions to increase our results. That's the traditional way we do things. With Picasso or Duchamp, they didn't do that. What they did is that they challenged not the actions, but the values. Why do we do what we do? Why should we use perspective? Why should we use paintings or novel marble to create a sculpture? Through a deviation, through using things which are not supposed to be used, they started to change the values. And through that, you change your actions 
and therefore your results. A new question for you. In this current crisis, do you believe that your organization also needs to challenge your core values? Or do you want to optimize your current processes? Or maybe both. You need to optimize your current processes and change uh, your values. So what do you think? So you go back to menti.com and you can vote. Uh, so either for optimize your current processes, challenge your core values, or both dimensions. Okay, so again, we can we can see a, a majority of people who think that they have to change their core values and also optimize the current processes. So let let make a, let me introduce two concepts which are very key. Organization need to exploit their processes, their traditional business model to make profit. For that, you need to optimize your current processes. But you also need to explore. You need to maybe change what you do, especially when the environment is completely upside down, when you're facing a crisis. So you absolutely need to challenge your core values when you're facing that. Otherwise, you're going to end up like Kodak, right? And some people claim that if you want to uh, be sustainable, you need both. You need to explore and you need to explore, exploit. This is called the ambidextrous organization. And you can also develop an ambidextrous leadership to do so. In this seminar, in this webinar, we're going to focus on the exploration. So I won't address the question of optimization, but we'll just discuss this question of challenging the core values. How can we do that? How can we uh, change our core values? Through the deviation. To help you do the deviation, to improve your capacity to deviate, you probably want to have three enablers, a seniors, and heterotopia, and critics. Let's go back to the case of the uh, cubism and the cubists. Picasso was, of course, the genius, but he wasn't alone. He had a genius around himself. He was working with other people, and especially Georges Braque, a French uh, famous painter. He was also working with Guillaume Apollinaire, uh, a famous poet, and uh, a German curator, a German art dealer, Daniel Henri Kainweiler. Without them, you know, it, won't, it would have been so much more difficult to do what he was doing because these guys were helping each other, challenging each other, sharing tips, sharing ideas, uh, sharing a network to sell pieces of art, and that's really key. So maybe when you want to deviate, you want to ask yourself, do I have friends, people that I enjoy working with, which are ch challenging what I do, and they are maybe way beyond my company, way beyond my, my field of expertise. So that's the first dimension. Second one, uh, is the sinus, is the heterotopia, sorry. Uh, here you can see the Bateau Lavoir, which is where uh, Pablo Picasso used to live with other artists, uh, for instance, Mike Jacob. Uh, and uh, it's very key to understand that when you create, at first you need to be protected, you need to be hidden, you need to be able to think a bit crazy and radical uh, propositions without being judged right away. And that's what Michel Foucault also uh, labeled as heterotopia. So, Utopia uh, do not exist physically, but heterotopia, they are uh, existing physically, but they are to some extent inside and outside the world. You can, inside this, uh, this uh, place, reinvent, rethink the world and, and challenge the world. Michel Foucault gave the example of a boat. On a boat, you can really, you are in the world, but you can you know, rethink about society. And to some extent, this battle lava was the perfect example of a heterotopia. So how can, how can you organize your own little garage, you know, your own little environment protected from others to push your propositions? But of course, sometimes you're going to have to expose what you do. And critics are really, really critical. You want to have critics, and probably harsh critics are sometimes very good. At that uh, time, you had Henri Matisse, who was one of the major famous painters, and Picasso was a sort of outsider. Uh, and Matisse was a bit teasing this uh, new uh, artist, and, and he, he made a, a kind of a, a joke saying that, you know, all these little uh, cubes that you can see on the painting, and this notion of cubes was reused by another critic, uh, Louis Voxel, a famous critic, who wrote about one of the Braque's painting, Georges Braque's painting, saying, you know, there are only little cubes on the painting. From this term was forged the, the, the movement of cubism. So here you can see how, um, 
how your critiques can help you understand what you're doing. Because that's very key that as a manager, usually you need very precise and clear goal. When you are an artist and when you deviate, you don't exactly know what you do. Uh, it's very emergent, but the critics can help you better understand what you are challenging, what you are, what, what you are changing, and then helps you to fix and freeze uh, a new note. And that's what's interesting with the deviation is that at first you are confused, but then suddenly you create a new norm. You create a new type of painting, the cubism, and then you can once again succeed and perform because you are not going to try to be just like Claude Monet or Henri Matisse. You're going to be like Pablo Picasso. It's another story. These uh, examples are very accurate for us. And when you look at Silicon Valley, you have the same kind of situation. You have a seniors, you have heterotopians with all these incubators, and you have a lot of critiques about these new uh, fast growing companies as well. Think about how you could organize this uh, on your own, uh, in your own site. Okay, what about the situation outside the art world? How can we deviate the deviation and maybe shift the improbable to a new norm? Let's take an example related to cubism. If you look at cubist painting, it looks, you know, not very uh, coherent, not very useful, a bit weird, uh, but actually it was deviated by the French army to create camouflage. As uh, Pablo Picasso said, uh, the harlequins that he made was perfect to make the French army invisible. And actually, the French army hired several uh, cubist painters to create this camouflage on trucks, on tanks, and many, many uh, pieces of art creating uh, in history were deviated, sort of re recuperation by the system for purpose, for something very useful uh, and utilitarian. On the other side, deviation can also help and support subversion. A very famous movement, which is called the Situationist International, developed during the 60s uh, some deviations to support, you know, a sort of anti-capitalist, anti-society, anti-consumption society, anti -society uh, activities. We have here an example where you deviate uh, uh, comics uh, to add uh, discourses about revolution. If you want to come to a closer period of time and, and look at a contrary example, I would like to share with you this picture that I took at Le Louvre Museum. Uh, it was a great night for me. So every uh, for the first Saturday of every month, uh, you have the free night at Le Louvre, uh, when it used to be open, of course. And they have this workshop inside the museum. So here, uh, they deviated, you know, a start-up start, start comedian uh, in a place which was not supposed to be a startup comedy show. Uh, and of course, you have a huge impact. You know, people are clapping in the Louvre, people are laughing, you have people with multiple social backgrounds. It's a fantastic situation to experience. So, of course, some people may disagree with that uh, because you challenge the norm, the existing norm of the museum. But that's uh, making, maybe that's the process of making a new museum. So, if you want to replicate this kind of deviation, I'd like to share with you a framework. You need four components, four ingredients, four layers to make a deviation. First, you need to think about your initial frame. What's your context? What is the existing norm? Second, how can I deviate things, symbols, objects, place, people, to change the norm, to change my frame? When I implement that, I'm going to create a situation which will probably prov provoke some surprises, some cleavages, some debates, some oppositions. But eventually, along the way, you may have a new norm and you may have a new emerging vision. Let's take a, a case in the business world. I'm sure you know about the Swash. So once sw the Swash case uh, emerged, it was at the very beginning of the 18, uh, 1918. And at that time, the Swiss uh, uh, industry in watch was more luxury, high-end products, very complicated, uh, very mechanical, very expensive. And two engineers from a small company, ETA, started to deviate um, plastic objects. They made a, a, a sketch uh, to describe you know, this potential watch. And of course, at first, the, the, the boss was not so uh, happy about this proposition. But eventually, he understood that you know, the situation was so bad, so desperate, that maybe we can try that. Uh, and eventually, he had this new emerging vision about a watch which could be like a tie. You can change your tie every day, you can change your watch every day. So here you have a completely new norm. You know, it's still, it's still a Swiss-made 
uh, watch is still qualitative because you know it's, it doesn't break in a day, but then it's much less expensive. Uh, it's colorful. It's with plastic. It's a new design. It's a new marketing. So here you can see that through a deviation, you can grow uh, you know to a sort of fuzzy process uh, with a clear goal. The feedback, the critics will help you understand better what you do to freeze your norm, to freeze the new norm. Good news is that you don't need to be creative to do that. You don't need to be creative, you just need a method. If you follow a method, you're going to be able to create deviations, just a gesture. So I designed a method that if you follow this method, you're going to create the improbable with certainty. So you go back to the site of certainty that I mentioned, and you're going to create something improbable, something new which can help you create new norms. This method is based on six practices. I emphasize only one today with a deviation. So I won't you know, detail all these steps. I'm happy to uh, share with you some uh, content about that and, and discuss that later on. Uh, but that's basically a process. You follow the steps and you're going to find the way to make it uh, work. I'm super happy to, uh, uh, to uh, thank my, my dear colleague, Pierre Tectin, an artist that I've been working with for the last 10 years uh, to uh, elaborate this method and teach these methods uh, in different uh, 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 environments. Um, and uh, as uh, Sean explained, we had the pleasure to teach the Art Thinking Workshop uh, with Ecole Pro from Centre Pompidou in this uh, fascinating uh, room, uh, Leopold Banchini. And we have some interesting production, uh, like this piece, uh, that I shared with you uh, on the network some, some days ago. Uh, so this piece is a deviation of a famous piece from Marcel Duchamp, the urinal, uh, the Fontaine. Uh, some of you may, may know this piece from Marcel Duchamp. And basically, the students wanted to, to discuss about the norm of, of water. How do we use water? As you may know, in France, drinkable water uh, is, is um, I mean, when you flush the toilet, sorry, you use drinkable water, which is completely uh, mad when you think about all the uh, drought situations we are facing in France right now. And to, to, to make us understand and think about that, they were serving the famous French alcohol, Ricard, during the exhibition with the water inside uh, the toilet. So that's an example of a piece pr produced by students, and that's an example of a deviation. Another one, which can give an idea about how you can also be a sort of avant-garde, uh, in 2012, way before the Yellow Vest movement in France, uh, some students created the Gilet Jaune, you know, uh, to question the fact that we tend to have very small uh, social circle. It's hard to, to escape these circles, it's hard to expand your network. And, and, and what they did during the, the, the exhibition, the opening, is that they proposed to uh, carry a yellow vest. So then you welcome people uh, with a sort of smile because, you know, that's kind of fun to, to, to interact with the yellow vest and you can make the, the network visible. So that's another example of a deviation that we had in the past uh, during the workshops. OK, so if you're interested in this practice, I'm happy to give you some follow ups for free. Uh, events that you may want to follow. So one is uh, the next opening. So obviously it won't be a physical opening. We'll make it online uh, with 90 students from the Master in Management of ESCP, uh, where students will discuss and, 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 and show, uh, think about the, 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 the monde d'après. So what's the situation for our world uh, after the, the, this crisis of COVID-19? Uh, I really also recommend you to visit the uh, 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 an activity developed by a friend and colleague, Margot Derry, who is part of the Art Thinking Collective. Uh, she designed this event with all of her colleagues, uh, Les Amis des Artistes, to support artists who are facing economic difficulties. Uh, and it's a great way to support artists. And last but not least, you have uh, the uh, Paris Gallery Weekend. We have been partnering with the Paris Gallery Weekend. It's a great uh, moment to visit art galleries in Paris and rediscover uh, all these fantastic locations uh, to meet artists and great art. Okay, so uh, I think we are facing a, a terrible situation, a very unusual situation. I don't have the magic recipe, but I really believe that the deviations can help us rethink about our norms, uh, rethink about the challenges, for instance, of, uh, of uh, uh, the ecological mutation. And art is a, a wonderful landscape to, to, to learn and to rethink what we do. Uh, and I strongly agree with uh, the French artist Robert Fillou, uh, who said that art is what makes life more interesting than art. 
uh, and I hope that this webinar uh, was uh, interesting enough for you and I'm super excited to uh, listen to your questions and comments uh, and I guess that we can share a bit uh, before the end of the, the webinar. I don't know, Sean, if we have uh, questions so far. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sylvain. That was an excellent presentation and some, some great ideas. Um, so we're going to begin now answering some of the questions that came in during today's presentation. Um, as a reminder, you can still submit some questions um, on the questions pane in your attendees, your attendees control panel. Uh, so our first question in comes in from uh, Helen, or Helen uh, and she's asking, what are the differences between art thinking and design thinking? Right. Um, so let me, I think, uh, so I have some appendixes and I think I may have tried to answer that question. Um, yes. So basically, uh, you know, art thinking and art in general, by the way, is not about finding solutions. It's about reframing, changing your questions. So art thinking is a lot about how can you reframe your problems. Uh, so you, tr you try to, to unlearn to some extent and then you can experiment on the local situation uh, with design. Design is obsessed by users. You have to have an empathy with users. Artist is more about uh, the creator himself. What do you have to say yourself? So it's not about the feed between your project and, and, and the market. It's not about the feed between you and your project. If you don't have connection with your project, if you don't you know, have a sense of passion, energy related to your project, you won't make it. Uh, so art thinking is probably very complementary to design thinking and business thinking, of course, but it's probably a sort of a, a, a posture before that uh, to really frame differently your problems. That's, that's what I could say probably today. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have a, a very interesting question in from Mohammed, who's asking, can you give examples of deviations used by companies to face COVID-19? Uh, yeah, um, so it's hard to, to answer because we, you know, it's still very uh, new, but I probably have three examples, but I also, uh, so, so one example uh, that you may have heard of is this company we used to, to create plastic bags, uh, and now they are creating, uh, you know, uh, clothes for uh, health people, healthcare uh, practitioners, to protect themselves uh, to, to operate and work. So here, once again, the norm of the, of the health, health clothes is very high, you know, you have high uh, norm of quality, and then you use a plastic bag, uh, you know, to, to, to store garbage, to make uh, this kind of clothes. So here you deviate the whole factory, the whole processes. So of course, you have to reinvent yourself uh, to produce these kind of solutions. Another example is also related to hospitals, which is uh, which make me, of course, at unease, and, and probably uh, you will uh, be in the same situation. I don't know if you heard about this uh, uh, project in in Colombia, uh, so they they face major uh, financial problems, and they can't have enough beds and coffins. So what they created through uh, using cardboard, it, they create a bed which can transform in a coffin. So obviously this is really a terrible situation. Uh, and that's another example of a, of a deviation which challenged the norms and which make the norm way below uh, the, the current situation. Of course, you could also think about uh, the auto industry and a lot of companies and car makers are switching to produce uh, you know, devices uh, for hospitals as well. So that's some of the examples I have in mind. And of course, they, 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 a lot of them are going to pop up uh, in the coming months to face this crisis. Okay, we have uh, Pietre Verhove who's asking uh, is that it seems to be that there are parallels between art thinking and the blue ocean approach. Um, what are the differences? Okay, so uh, very correct in the sense that you don't try to compete in the same uh, market. So for those of you who are not familiar with blue ocean, uh, Blue Ocean is the idea that you know if you compete with the same uh, rules, the same uh, criteria than your competitors, it's going to be really super hard. So, for instance, I want to uh, create a new uh, hotel chain. Well, you have already a you know boiling market. It's going to be very hard. So, if you have a completely new mindset, you're going to create uh, the um, the Airbnb type of logic, right? Or blah blah car towards you know SNCF and all these transportation companies. 
So this is uh, this logic. And of course, our thinking, I would say our thinking is helping you to find these blue oceans. And the blue ocean strategy is a sort of a way to operationalize and make it uh, uh, sustainable financially on the long run. So our thinking, once again, is a complement to business thinking. Uh, and it's a way to uh, probably challenge heavily and strongly your norms to go towards a blue ocean strategy. Uh, so I would say they are complementary and Blue Ocean is obsessed with, uh, at some point, the, the financials, the business models. In our thinking, we don't address this question. Uh, we are more about, uh, you know, discussing the norms uh, uh, than the business model itself. It's com it comes a bit later. So, so we have a question in from Shutri, who's, who's challenging you here. He's asking, what is the success rate of art thinking? Uh, it feels like an innovative theory, but relatively weak compared to design thinking. Okay, so, so uh, art thinking is uh, very new, right? I mean, it's compared to design thinking, it's quite new. So we have been doing that with, uh, you know, uh, major corporations. Uh, uh, so, for instance, Galerie Lafayette, for instance, Canon. Uh, for instance, uh, La Redoute in France, uh, we, we did it also with uh, uh, a major bank, uh, Banque Populaire Caisse d'Epargne. Um, and what we can observe, of course, is first uh, it's, uh, the workshops. Uh, maybe I can, and can move to this slide. Let me see. Uh, this workshop is, of course, first of all, helping you to develop competencies. Uh, so competencies, uh, sorry about these slides. Uh, let me see. Okay. As you know, uh, the competencies that are needed are changing. So this is a, a, a table from the World Economic Forum. And on the growing needs in terms of skills, you have uh, you know, uh, all these uh, red circles are competencies that we develop during the Art Thinking Workshop. So we have many elements. We tend to show that doing the Art Thinking Workshop help you boost these competencies. So agile methods, creativity, critical thinking, you know, complex problem solving, uh, entrepreneurial leadership, emotional intelligence. So the main package that you're going to find is really all these competencies. And many uh, people that are experiencing this workshop tell us, you know, uh, three months later, six months later, how they implemented all these competencies on the ground in a very tangible way. Second, the, the piece itself that you're going to create can help you rethink your strategy. And for instance, we had a, a we, we have a case of a, of a piece of art who, which became a startup, uh, Mami Foodie, which is a, a company with uh, reinventing the catering uh, industry, uh, and they they started uh, through uh, a piece of art. So uh, art thinking is super strong in terms of the learnings. Uh, it's super strong also in terms of emotion that you're going to experience because it, you know it's a revelation for a lot of people that are joining our workshop. They are not creative people. Uh, they are not supposed to create pieces of art and they don't feel themselves that they can do it. And once they did it, once they had this exhibition ready and they look at what they did and they have all this great feedback from the audience, they realize that they can do it. So when they go back to work, they, they understand that they can do it. And, you know, I have a lot of uh, testimonies, especially uh, today, because we are facing this high incredible world and they, uh, they, they better understand even more how this uh, method can help them in these improbable times. Okay. We have a, a comment and a question from Munia, uh, who says, uh, awesome presentation, so, so thank you very much. Um, this is really interesting to see how attendees think that they should change their values and processes. Uh, what about the spirit to accept and be positive-minded? Is, is, is this something that the art thinking can facilitate? Yeah. So the art thinking workshop is super hard uh, actually to experience. Uh, you you know you so we have this so it's an agile method. Uh, so basically we create improbable groups. We give them topics which are very key for them. So for instance, could be circular economy, blockchain, artificial intelligence, and then we have conferences where an artist and a, an expert in entrepreneurship business will present some practices, and then we launch them into workshops. And what's happening is always uh, the same. You know, at the very beginning, people are either skeptical or kind of, you know, interesting, curious about the, the workshop. They start with a workshop which is quite okay and easy and fun. Uh, and then we start the deviation practice. And it's a bit harder because then they realize that they don't have to be good students or good managers. They have to be themselves. They have to propose something which is weird and different. And they start to be lost. 
And if you develop a creative practice, if you don't feel lost, if you don't feel the pain, it means you don't work. You know, you cannot be happy all the time. And at some point, you have to be critical. You have to be tough uh, to some extent so that you can move on and don't accept, you know, an okay thing. Uh, so people have a hard time. Usually it's a bit like, I would say, a bit uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Jacqueline Fent, uh, who launched uh, the chair of entrepreneurship at ESCP, uh, compare the situation just like when you are a pregnant woman. Uh, so at the beginning, uh, you are you are happy, you know, you have a baby. But usually around the second, third months, your, your body uh, is at unease because you have a new creation inside yourself. And also at the eighth month, uh, just before the baby will born, then you are also at unease because, you know, it's, it's too heavy, it's too big. Uh, and then when your baby is born, you are super happy that's your baby and, and you don't accept any critique. The same is true uh, to some extent with art. You know, uh, when you start working on your stuff, the emergence is very confusing. You don't really know what it is. It's like a monster. You are afraid of what's happening. Uh, you are unease. And then suddenly you, you better understand, you control more the process. Your body is accepting this new uh, proposition. Uh, and of course, also at the end, before the opening, you know, you are in a rush, you are stressed. Uh, it's not done. You have to fix some problems. And that's also not so comfortable. And at the end, of course, this is your baby, your piece. You are super proud of it. You get feedback. Uh, that's interesting. So uh, you have to be confident. You have to trust the method, but sometimes you, you cannot be positive because you have to be despaired in that time. That's okay. That's part of the process. As long as you trust the process, you'll be fine. That's uh, that's the recommendation. And that's why I'm saying you don't need to be creative. You don't need to be, you know, all the time, uh, you know, with a sort of all the time positive mind. No, no, just follow the process. Do your work. It's going to be fine. It's going to work. Uh, I have a very interesting question from from Claire, uh, since we have people on the, the webinar from, from all around the world. So uh, she's asking, do you see any differences uh, across cultures when you teach the uh, Art Thinking Seminar? Okay, that's it's a uh, big question. Uh, so we did this seminar, you know, uh, uh, not only in different cultures. We had so Armenia, Finland, uh, Canada, uh, the US, uh, Japan, uh, Germany. Spain, France, so very diverse. We also have people who are top officials from the French army. We have coders, we have engineers, designers, so a bunch of people. Because this is a method, it's working exactly the same for everybody. So I would say that you know the core is not changing, but of course uh, the appropriation, the action may dif differ. So for instance, in Finland, people tend to be very quiet. They are not very talkative. So when you present your stuff. You know, the, the silence is very maximum. When you have the feedback sessions, you know, they don't talk much. And at first, you know, I was very at unease. I was like, what's happening? But eventually they, they get it and, and it's, it's working very well. Uh, Japanese, uh, to be a bit uh, stereotyping here, uh, they will take more time at the beginning because they have uh, this high collegial culture. So they will talk a lot uh, at the beginning of the process. But once they, 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 they are ready, then the execution is impressive. Uh, comparing, you know, a lot of our French participants, the level of quality is super high, uh, and the level of execution is impressive. So you have some differences, but I would say that's more like a, a minor. And and the only big difference, of course, it's about the content. You know, when we do the the, the conferences, we always use uh, pieces of art uh, related to the country. We we, we use, you know, uh, German artists when we are in Germany. We use uh, Finnish artists or Japanese artists. So so to have connection with the local culture. Um, and of course, the people doing the piece of art, they, they, they raise questions related to their own context, related to their own culture. So the big difference is more about the productions uh, than the process. Uh, just an interesting comment from, from Sarah, who says that uh, I find it interesting, the idea of breaking down the dichotomy between the artist and the non-artist and allowing people to enter into the act of making art as part of the as part of the process so i think that's a that's a, that's a great comment um one to comment, uh, question comment, uh, yes sorry the please, many yeah. artists in the 20th century tried to 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 stop and to kill this vision between art and non-art so for instance uh, the situationist that i mentioned uh, wanted to make you know uh, to, to change practices on the ground in life and to change life and not only to create pieces of art which will go in the museum. Uh, 
Uh, same is true to some extent with Joseph, Joseph Beuys, a uh, German artist. We also wanted to emphasize all the creativity, the creative practice that people have on their everyday life. So you have a lot of movement in art trying to escape you know, the, the, the limited world of art uh, and the institutional world of art. Uh, my assumption is that um, in many companies, in many organizations, you are asked to be creative. You are supposed to be able to create, to be agile, to critique what's happening, to change the way you do things. And I think we should be able to train uh, people. And you don't probably have time to go for five years at the Beaux Arts de Paris, you know, Ecole des Beaux Arts, and to be trained as an artist. So this workshop is a sort of degrading the norm. You know, I deviated art and I degrade the norm to make it accessible. So, of course, during the workshop, I don't pretend you're going to be an artist, that's for sure. But you just better understand creation and using a method you can you know act and expand your possibilities that's that's the idea uh, anthony is asking what are the key uh, benefits or takeaways of a of an art thinking workshop and, and also he's asking how he can attend okay uh, so you have two main impacts so the first one is related to the competencies that i mentioned earlier uh, so you have a list of competencies that you're going to develop, you know, in terms of heuristics, the way you think and act as a creative person. Uh, you're going to, you know, learn how to prototype. You're going to learn how to expose your work. You're going to learn about how to work as a group in a group. You know, so you, there's a lot of leadership involved. Uh, how you can also uh, try things and learn to fail. You know, this process, this workshop is a lot of failures. So you only fail until you have something interesting. So it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting aspect to to learn uh, learning and failures. So all these competencies are, are key. And then the second impact is, of course, related to the, to the piece of itself. So through a piece of art, you can rethink your strategy, you can rethink your organization, you can rethink your market. So you ha really have this process and, and, and outcome product uh, as a result. Uh, regarding attending workshops, so uh, you, you have, I guess, uh, uh, two main options. One is uh, you are going to join a, a program at ESCP. Uh, so this workshop is taught, you know, in the Master in Management program, uh, is taught in the MDL, Executive Master in Digital Innovation and Entrepreneurial Leadership. Uh, uh, it is also taught uh, at uh, Executive PhD, Executive MBA. Uh, so you have different programs where you can join. Or you can also um, uh, join through your corporation. So your company can, you know, decide to have a, a customized workshop for your company and we can you know, discuss the topics and the format for your own cooperation. So I think that's the, the possibilities we offer. Uh, maybe, Sean, you, you want to add something on that? I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe I forgot something. No, I think you've, you covered uh, We've opened programs, degree programs, uh, and our custom programs, which which integrate this this, this method, and it, uh, the, the feedback is very good. Perhaps uh, time is running on, but maybe just one more question, uh, and it's from uh, Bertrand. And he's asking us, how do you overcome uh, defensive routines? Mentioning that defensive uh, routines really explain why it's difficult to make change happen. Yeah, very, uh, very difficult question. Um, so I would say that uh, the, the, the workshop, uh, during the workshop, we have defensive routine appearing. You know, uh, I don't want to talk, I don't want to move, I don't want to do that. Uh, it's bad, I don't understand, you know, so sometimes we had uh, this kind of uh, defensive routine during the workshop uh, and, and, uh, and the process is made in such a way that uh, it, 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 you cannot uh, sustain them. Why? Because we don't try to convince the 100% of the participants at first. So we move on with some subgroups of people, but the results of these subgroups are so good that I would say that 99% of the time, even the most you know, people who are really against what you do, they will be convinced because they see the results. You know, that's for instance, we had with the executive MBA of ACP an improved workshop at Le Grand Palais, you know, the, the Grand Palais Museum. Um, we had 22 pieces and it was just amazing what they did. Uh, the results were really surprising and it makes sense. You know, they, they, the, the projects are really, really interesting in terms of content. They did it in a very fast way, so it's very efficient. It's, it's, a, it's a, I mean, our thinking is super efficient. A lot of people are saying, you know, we don't have enough resources, we need to reduce costs. These techniques are super, super efficient. You can do crazy things in, in two days, and you're amazed by that. So these defensive attitudes are, are stopped by that. Then, of course, what is more difficult is after, you know, when you go back to your corporation, 
what's happening and then so we we tried two things so one is to create you know long-term programs with different modules so you can keep the link and try to have more long-term transformations and of course we also have interaction with uh, the executive the people on top of the company to think about new organizational uh, logics new new uh, you know processes uh, new responsibilities to to help change the culture but as you you, you know this is uh, probably the hardest part of course yeah. well, thank you very much um i think it's uh very obvious how passionate you are about this, uh, this, the, the, the subject, the subject and this, and this method. But I think we've run out of out of time now. Um, I want to thank you again, uh, Sylvain, uh, and thank you everyone for the, uh, attending today's webinar. Uh, Working in an improbable world: What can we learn from artists? We look forward to seeing you at our our next webinar, uh, which yeah, is our yeah. fifth webinar with with Martin uh, Coop and Rene, Rene Maurer, uh, Building Uncertainty Competence, Applying the Entrepreneurial Method, which will be on the 28th of May at, at 11.30. So on behalf of ESCP Business School, uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, so stay healthy and, and stay safe. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Enjoy your day. Thank you very much. Again. Thank you.